Welcome all of you. Uh, it's a wonderful day for us here um, in the world of Berkeley to be celebrating the uh, inauguration of the Kavli Energy Nanosciences Institute at Berkeley. And um, I'm Paul Alavisados, and I, I really deeply want to uh, welcome all of you here. Uh, lots of colleagues from around Berkeley, but just so many of you who have come uh, from around the world to celebrate with us, and so many of you have contributed so significantly in, in helping our community to function. And I just thought I would start by saying that um, you know, the world that we live in is one where um, uh, science advances uh, most beautifully when we have a deep level of cooperation. And some of that cooperation takes place locally at a place like this, when all the different science disciplines can come together and engineering uh, to, to really to make new progress. And, and the problems of, um, of, of energy science are such that it, it really requires that kind of deep interaction. And, and so uh, what, what's being created with this new institute is a marvelous, marvelous community uh, beyond any specifics of infrastructure and all those things that we'll be talking about, uh, what's really happened um, with the help of the, uh, of the Kavli Foundation is the creation of a, a wonderful community um, here at Berkeley of people interacting with each other and learning from each other and, and creating um, a fantastic environment. And, and what's even more wonderful for us is that we can join a, a global community that Kavli has created with colleagues from around the world, many of whom have come here to celebrate with us. And, and that part is also something that we really uh, are deeply grateful for, the ability to be able to work uh, with all of our colleagues in, in other Kavli Institutes around, around the globe uh, who are here visiting and who you'll be seeing uh, forthwith. So um, we're gonna have just uh, some introductory remarks uh, coming now from um, people who are here uh, to visit with us. But, but before I do that, I just want to take one moment and say that um, when we look today um, at what's happening um, around the world, uh, we see so many uh, really difficult problems to solve in the area of energy and environment. Uh, just this past weekend, I was uh, reading a wonderful book uh, that I would recommend, well, wonderful, I guess. Uh, it's called The Sixth Extinction, and it's about what's happening to species around the world uh, at this moment in time. And, and, and it really gives you um, a, a way of thinking about all the environmental changes that are happening in the world. And, and that emphasizes to us the extent to which it's so important for us to be able to really harness all of the um, intellect and energy that we can uh, to, to create new solutions in that space. And, and one of the things that really is very striking to me is that sometimes when we have a very important problem to solve, we want to go as fast as possible. Then we just want to kind of use the solutions that we have at hand. <laughs> and that means we might just try to take a technology that already exists and just kind of incrementally push it along. And, and, and in the area of energy, um, that's particularly prevalent. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, we already have all the solutions we need, we're just not implementing them. Uh, and, and I think that really misses the enormous, enormous opportunity which exists when we look at how energy is converted on a very small length scale. And uh, there are profoundly new aspects of physics and chemistry and engineering that arise when we look on very, very small length scales at the energy conversion processes and uh, we can see new quantum phenomena, new interference phenomena that we don't normally control in an ordinary energy conversion. And we have just enormous opportunities as well on the chemical front to create um, new ways of understanding how to manipulate molecular systems, how to create catalysis, how to direct the flow of energy in molecules on the nanoscale. And so one of the things is very, very wonderful about um, the philosophy of the Kavli Foundation is that it truly believes that, um, that we should be trying to create uh, deeply new knowledge. And there's a deep reverence that I've encountered from my very first days of dealing with the Kavli Foundation, a deep reverence for wanting to foster new ideas and, and foundational new science. And I think that's 
even more important when we have a problem that's challenging for society. The reason it's challenging is because we don't actually have solutions that are ready at hand the way we would like them to be. So it's wonderful that we have this opportunity and that the Kavli Foundation is enabling us to work on problems that are deep, uh, but also practically important, and that it does it by creating these communities locally and globally. So I really want to express my, my, my deep um, appreciation. We're now, we're going to have um, some opening remarks from um, many people who have come to visit with us, and I'm especially pleased uh, that we can start um, by having um, Mr. Rockel Hankin speak first. He's the chairman of the Kavli Foundation, and um, we're very, very fortunate that he can be here. Uh, he's chairman of the board of Semtec Corporation, which is an analog semiconductor company um, listed on the NASDAQ. We, of course, hope to create quantum semiconductor companies <laughs> one day. <laughs> but in the meantime, that's wonderful. And, <laughs> and he's a, also chairman of the board of the Kavli Foundation, which is um, just a very special foundation, as I've been trying to say. And um, he's also chairman um, or board member of seven other listed companies and 11 private companies as well as many charitable organizations. And um, so I think you can get a sense from that that he's a person who really knows how to help change the world in ways that matter a great deal to all of us. And so, um, Rock, we're very fortunate that we can have you here. Please uh, come up. It is a real pleasure to be back in my native California and to uh, be here at this fountainhead of higher education and research. I was proud to have graduated from a southern campus, uh, UCLA, some years ago. Uh, it's just really, really wonderful to be back in touch here. So the Kavli Energy Nanoscience Institute is the 17th Kavli Institute. It's the fifth Kavli Institute that's devoted to nanoscience. It joins nanoscience institutes at Cornell, Caltech, Delft, and Harvard. And I want to join Paul in thanking all of you for making the trip here to open up this wonderful institute. It's also the last Kavli Institute endowed by our foundation during uh, our founder, Fred Kavli's lifetime. It's very important to him. These institutes, all of our institutes, are emblematic of our enduring curiosity. The scientists comprising these institutes follow their curiosity to help us unravel the mysteries of the universe, the performance of the smallest structures, and the complexity of the brain. Their curiosity and their pursuit of science for its own sake have enriched us all. They inquire into questions that have always been with us, and will endure as long as man expresses curiosity about the universe he inhabits. Fred Cavalli had this to say about endowing the Cavalli Energy Nanoscience Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. Quote, I am delighted to welcome the Cavalli NSI into the community of Cavalli Institutes. By exploring the basic science of energy conversion and biological systems, as well as building entirely new hybrid and perhaps even completely artificial systems, the Kavli ENSI is positioned to revolutionize our thinking about science of energy and is positioned to do the kind of basic research that will ultimately make this a better world for all of us. Our foundation is dedicated to the goals of advancing science for the benefit of humanity and promoting increased public understanding and support for scientists and their work. We implement this mission through an international program of research institutes, professorships, and symposia in the fields of astrophysics, nanoscience, neuroscience, and theoretical physics, as well as prizes in the fields of astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. Fred Cavalli created the foundation after enjoying a life of extraordinary success in business and industry, and in creating the foundation, 
He consulted with many leaders from the scientific, academic, philanthropic, and business worlds. Some of these leaders are members of the foundation board today. One of them was Jack Peltison, who was president of the University of California some years ago. Fred concluded that there was insufficient funding for basic research. He also concluded that even the biggest and most successful academic research programs were in need of completely discretionary funding to support new ideas and initiatives. So the foundation set about endowing institutes and disciplines that were exploring questions that were eternal. Astrophysics, the science of the universe, neuroscience, the science of the brain, theoretical, the theoretical physics, the science of physical reality, and nanoscience, science at the atomic scale. Often he referred to these as science of the biggest, the smallest, and the most complex. Institutes endowed by the foundation are now entering their third phase of funding, which will raise their endowments to roughly $30 million each, representing a million and a half dollars per year of discretionary spending for each institute. Today, our endowment exceeds one half billion dollars. Among other initiatives, the foundation actively encourages open dialogue and exchange of ideas between scientists, especially including cross-disciplinary dialogue and exchanges. From these meetings have come ideas such as the brain activity map, which involved leading scientists from both neuro and nano and ultimately catalyzed the President's Brain Initiative. We sponsor many of these meetings each year, and we're always on the lookout for opportunities to encourage future developments in the scientific fields the Foundation supports. We also sponsor the Cavalier Prize. These prizes are presented in cooperation and in partnership with the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters and the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. The prizes, as you know, are awarded at a ceremony in Oslo, Norway, which was Fred Cavalier's native country, and the president of the Norwegian Academy presides. Cavalier Prize recipients are chosen by three prize committees that are independent of our foundation, and they're comprised of distinguished international scientists recommended by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the French Academy of Sciences, the Max Planck Society, the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, the US National Academy of Sciences, and the Royal Society. After making their selection for award recipients, the recommendations of these prize committees are confirmed by the Norwegian Academy of Sciences. Our first prizes were awarded in 2008. They're awarded in two-year cycles. There are now 31 Cavalier Prize laureates. Eight of these are in nanoscience. We chose the Energy Nanoscience Institute at Berkeley because you simply have one of the world's most outstanding research enterprises in nanoscience. The combination of faculty and staff at both the UC Berkeley campus and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory made enormous sense. We do, in fact, track carefully the quality of activities at universities around the world in the areas we support astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. In the process of making this decision, we looked closely at eight other universities that needed to be considered. We are very disciplined in our choice of institutes. We look for scientific excellence, the commitment of the host institution, and the history of excellence in higher education and research, and the likelihood that such excellence will continue. With respect to the Cavalier Energy Neuroscience Institute, Nanoscience Institute, we were impressed that the goal of the Institute is to explore fundamental issues in energy science using new tools and methods of nanoscience. The NSI proposal emphasized the search beyond energy conversion approaches that, that ENSI would elucidate energy sciences and biological systems and build entirely new hybrid and completely artificial systems. These approaches are designed to establish the fundamental principles and ultimate limits of nanoscale energy conversion processes and will encourage scientists to investigate new architectures for nanoscale energy conversion systems. In addition, the NSI, we're going to have the resources of both UC Berkeley and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And of course, it has a distinguished and committed staff led by Paul, which we appreciated very much. So I'm delighted to be here at this inaugural symposium and note that we're at the flagship campus of the University of California. 
the university was organized in 1868, opened in 1869. It had 10 faculty and 40 students. Mm. In 2012, which was the last statistics I could come across, Berkeley had 36,000 students, 9,000 academic faculty, and 130 academic departments, but that's not all. The University of California itself had grown in the fall of 2012 to some 239,000 students and about 58,000 academic faculty. And we're also here at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which was founded in 1931 by Ernest Lawrence, a UC Berkeley physicist who won the 1939 Nobel Prize in Physics for his invention of the cyclotron circular particle accelerator that opened the door to high energy physics. It was Dr. Lawrence's belief that scientific research is best done through teams of individuals with different fields of expertise working together. And I understand that his teamwork concept is a Berkeley Lab legacy that continues today, as Paul mentioned himself. This is something we believe in also. Today, Berkeley Lab employs 4,200 scientists, engineers, support staff, and students. So the Cavley Foundation, we began our work in 2000. And in 2013, we endowed the 17th Cavley Institute, the Cavley NSI. Who can say what future generations will find when they visit here? <laughs> I'm certain it will be remarkable and that the contributions to the knowledge of mankind will be manifold. It is my honor to welcome you to this symposium. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate those words. Well, thank you so much for those very kind words. And indeed, um, I did have the opportunity during the period uh, leading up to this uh, institute being formed to interact a little bit with Fred Kaufley. And uh, it was late in his life, but he was bursting with energy. When you met him, you could just feel that there was a tremendous uh, strength uh, and also uh, I think if we look at him, we see somebody who um, he created new things um, in a practical way, but he had a deep reverence for new discovery. And uh, it's a remarkable story what he did with his life and how he dedicated it in turn to creating uh, new uh, abilities for society to grow and to adapt through the foundation. So, you know, Rock, we're, we're really deeply grateful to the foundation for the help that's coming here to our community. Uh, I'd like now also to turn to uh, introducing our next speaker, uh, Robert Kahn of Kahn. He is the president of the Kavli Foundation. Um, he was Zabel Professor and Dean Emeritus of the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Nuclear Society. In his own research, he's won many awards, including the Ernest O. Lawrence Award and many others, including, I think, one that Distinguished Alumni Award of the California Institute of Technology. It's hard to be a distinguished alum of Caltech when you consider. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but I want to take a moment away from the formal biography and just say, you know, for those who, who wouldn't know Bob, um, his, his research was in the field of fusion. And we know that in fusion, things have to get really hot. <laughs> and a lot of interaction has to take place too. And then suddenly things can start to join together. <laughs> and when they join together, it releases even more energy, if you get it right. And that's, of course, the struggle of the field of fusion. And I suppose those must have been the core principles that Bob has brought to our science community, because I can tell you, when I interacted with him over a period of time around forming this institute, it got hot. <laughs> there was a lot of energy, and he brought a lot of us together. 
And when we came together, we produced a lot more than we had been before. And so I think I can say very much on behalf of our whole community that you have really helped us, uh, educated us, and taught us uh, many ways of behaving and thinking that have been already invaluable to us. And I know, Bob, that uh, you have agreed actually to talk to us about the importance of trying to really uh, take science um, uh, support uh, into a different level than where it is so far. And your thinking is really informing our whole community and repeating on a much larger scale what I just described happened to us locally here uh, once we started having deep interactions with you. So, Bob, we're so pleased to have you here today. Well, it's a delight to be back at Berkeley. Um, I spent uh, 22, 23 years as a faculty member in the University of California system at both UCLA and UC San Diego. Uh, but I must tell you, some of my best graduate students came from Berkeley. And I was always admiring of that. And I visited during my academic career about as much as I possibly could. And I had great colleagues here over 30, 40 years. I want to add my welcome to all of you. It's terrific to see such a full auditorium coming to this seminar today. And hopefully, tomorrow morning, you'll find uh, the topics equally interesting. In fact, this is, these two talks by Rock Hankin, our chairman, and myself are probably the only two that aren't scientific. Uh, and, and it takes more than the scientist to get science done. And maybe the two of us at this stage of our lives are representing some of the things that help enable the infrastructure that makes science really possible. And so uh, first, I, I welcome you, and I thank you for all for coming. It's great to see the directors of the other Kavli Institutes, both from the US and around the globe, here, and other visitors. Um, I also want to, uh, right up front, thank a couple of the other donors who actually are enabling the Kavli Institute for Energy Nanosciences to grow the endowment to the level that Rock Hankin remarked about. And the first level we're going to get you to is 20 million, and when we're done with that, we're going to get you to 30. But right now, we're aiming at 20, and uh, we've had help, you have had help, from two remarkable groups. Um, in fact, Wilfred Chung is here from the Philomathia Foundation, and he and his brothers uh, have been very generous to Berkeley in a number of different ways. But in particular, they have provided some matching funds for the Kavli Institute here. So it's great to see you. Uh, the other group is the Heising Simons Foundation. And I don't think they are here, but I do want to remark they have also provided very significant funds as matching funds for the endowment of your institute. So uh, we thank them, and we hope you'll find more, and we're prepared to do much more. Uh, lastly, before I get to the subject, I want to recognize and thank Bob Bergeno and Graham Fleming, both of whom are here. Uh, there were some others, but I don't see them, but particularly Bob and Graham. Uh, when we uh, really became engaged in asking one of the world's greatest universities. Will you, in fact, be up to the standards of a Catholic? <laughs> Should have been the other way around, but that's the way we put it. And I think if you don't come at it from that point of view, you won't get the best out of the other people. And Paul sort of alluded to that. So conversations got hot, but they produced a terrific, terrific outcome. So Bob, thank you, uh, the former chancellor. Bob was chancellor for 10 years here through some very difficult times. And uh, I guess we were the last major donation you may have negotiated. So thank you. It's wonderful to see you, Bob. OK. Paul asked if I would talk about science, philanthropy, and its role in society. And uh, you know a lot about science, because I see a lot of young faces. Those young faces are mostly scientists. So you know about science. You think it's great. You want to do it. You're going to make things different. And you're going to have a lot of fun doing it. How you get it done, where the resources come from to enable you to do it, is something, particularly when you're young and particularly when you're a student, like I have been, we all have been, that piece of it you tend not to see. 
And yet that infrastructure that enables science is crucial. If society doesn't provide that infrastructure to advance science, we do not get where we are today. And that's a little bit of the story I'd like to describe to you. And in effect, although you're probably, most of you, not in a position to do something now, some of you will be in a position one day where you might be able to give back. And when you're able to give back, think about a little bit of the content of what I'm going to talk about today. Science matters. Now, how can we, uh, let's see, I've got to get this to work. Whoops. At the highest level, you could ask the macro question, how do I know that science matters? Why do, lots of things matter in life, so, so what's a good metric? Well, life expectancy has been taken as one of those high-level metrics for, are we doing better than generations before? In general, are people living longer? And are they living healthier lives as society progresses, hopefully progresses? And despite all the troubles in the world today, and we have troubles, there's no question, the rate at which people are dying is lower than ever before. And the length at which people are living is longer than it's ever been. And so if you look here, over the last 100 years, the chart sort of tells the story. And uh, the most interesting thing was I went and looked up the data for China. And China, 100 years ago, was less advanced economically at that point, for many reasons, uh, than Australia or Norway or the United States. In the intervening 100 years, and particularly with uh, not all due to science, uh, the Bare doc Foot Doctor program in the 60s made an enormous difference to the health of the average person in China. Today, you see China's average life expectancy in the mid-70s. It's not quite into the 80s, but it's, it's, it's uh, made enormous progress. Uh, some things happened over that 100 years. And the biggest thing that happened in the 20th century was the advances in science, technology, and engineering. Clean water, clean air, um, sanitation, uh, plus the extraordinary underpinnings that science provided to an economy. We're an information age economy today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. What is it built upon? And you'll see that it's built upon discoveries in physics, chemistry, biology, which if those discoveries aren't made, we aren't here today. We don't have the society or the wealth or the lifestyle that we have. And this is actually a longer look at all of this. Uh, the ages are up there on the left. So you know the first industrial age, second industrial age. You can have a look. <clears throat> and you look at life expectancy. And this is a chart where they've, they've tried to put together what country had the, at any given year had the longest life expectancy. So today it's 84 and it's, uh, it's Japan. Women in Japan live the longest of people anywhere on the globe. But all of a sudden, with Pasteur in particular, you see a change in the slope of the curve. And what was it behind that Pasteur was intrigued by? Well, he wanted to solve a problem, which was why were people dying, dying from diseases? And sometimes they were dying faster when they went into the hospital. Mm -hmm. And he had the notion of cleanliness, the notion that there might be bacteria, germs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, pasteurization, you all know about. You drink milk uh, and many other things. It's the way of keeping the germs out, so to speak. And all of a sudden, we got onto a different track. But that track it wasn't all Pasteur. When you got to the late 1890s and 19, early 1900s, physics and chemistry particularly, and subsequently biology, started to develop at a pace we'd never seen. And the developments in physics in particular from about 1890 through about 1930-35 was so stunningly upsetting in terms of our view of the world whether it was Einstein and relativity, or the notion of quantum, the quanta and quantum mechanics and statistics, uh, we thought about, had to come to think about the world entirely differently. So if you look historically, governments have understood that science matters to society. 
And they often did it because they understood certain science and engineering things mattered to warfare. And we've had warfare historically, so you, know, you, you don't put that under the covers. But we kept moving. This is a famous uh, painting of Galileo showing the Doge of Florence, a telescope. And interestingly, he was making all that. He got later in trouble with the church, you all know. But before he got in trouble with the church, he had a lot of support from, from Florence. And Florence, when it prospered the most, was a mercantile city-state, not dominated by a religious point of view, but dominated more by commerce. And they were very open to a lot of these sorts of ideas. Uh, Support for science from the government has become de rigueur in this century. And particularly after World War II, support by the US government of science in the United States was part of a strategy of <coughs> keeping us economically strong, healthy, and having a defense that was second to none. That was the policy of the Truman through Eisenhower through Kennedy through the rest, all the way to today. Um, and you'll see here a plot of the expenditures by the government on basic science. So this is not applications, this is not translation, this is not engineering. And you see that it peaks in about 2008, 2009. And you know we had a crisis in 2008 and 2009 economically. But it is not picking back up, even as the economy has picked back up. And so this chart has many uh, interesting facets to it, and I don't have the time to describe it. But I need to say a few things to show the importance of private philanthropic giving. If you look at the orange part, that's government giving, spending money on basic research at, mostly at the universities. And in fact, the universities get most of the money. We also have nonprofits. Nonprofits mean things like the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences, or Woods Hole, or Cold Spring Harbor, those sorts of places, which are not educational institutions, they're research institutions. Um, if you look at what the government is spending, it's coming down. But look at the second part, the purple piece. It says universities. Well, where are universities getting money to support basic science? It's seven and a half billion dollars. They're spending a lot more on other things. But seven and a half billion dollars is going to basic science. That's 25% of what the government's spending. It's coming from their endowments. Where did they get an endowment? You know, Stanford has an endowment of 20 million dollars. Harvard has an endowment of 35 billion. Uh, Stanford 20, Yale 23. And Berkeley's trying to get to five, four. <laughs> and you got to do better, but. When they have that endowment, every year they get 5% of it to spend. Every year they get 5% of it to spend. And when they spend it, it produces support for basic science and many other things. So it turns out, where did the endowment come from? It came from philanthropic giving. It came from people who did well and gave back. It's an integral piece of American culture for sure. Uh, nonprofits are also involved, but my main point here, philanthropy matters, and government funding for basic science is declining. So what about the future? Well, I would say to this audience, uh, mostly, well, people from all over the world, the impulse to give back in the United States has become really an ingrained cultural imperative. We do it as a society. We may think of ourselves as so individualistic, but the truth is we give back enormously. And we've been giving back for hundreds of years. The Smithsonian in Washington is from a gift from Smithson in the 1840s. It was a philanthropic gift. And certainly since the last Gilded Age of you know, the late 1800s, you had Carnegie and all the rest, Rockefeller. They have been giving back for 100 years through their legacy of what they left. And so there's this great arc of philanthropy in the United States. And I chose 1901 when Carnegie made his famous admonition 
uh, which paraphrasing was approximately, if you die with all your wealth, you die poor. To the Gates Buffett Pledge of 2012, which fundamentally asked those who have had the benefit of and have earned extraordinary wealth to consider giving half back, at least half. Many are giving more than half of what they created back. And so we have this great American cultural imperative. And I believe the key to advancing science in the 21st century, as you'll see, it was crucial in the first half of the 20th century, is going to be philanthropy. And this is especially tr true when it comes to supporting higher risk ideas and supporting the young people who are at the universities. So all the young faces out there should be happy. Hmm. Uh, you know, this is a, this imperative to give back has a distinguished history. I give some examples of uh, people and their foundations pre-1950s, that is the wealth made pre-1950, who uh, have been just catalytic in making a difference for science as well as society through the first half of the century. And they, some of them are still very, very active. Howard Hughes, of course, Carnegie. Uh, I wish Rockefeller were doing more in science than it's doing today. Uh, Post-1950, here's some recent examples. And I just listed them alphabetically. Um, Paul Allen from Microsoft. Notice that Bill Gates is not on this list. They're not focused on supporting science, and we're hoping to make a change in the philosophy there, whereas Paul Allen's doing the Allen Brain Institute and so on. So today, we really do have a thriving philanthropic enterprise. And one of the questions is, where can philanthropy help science advance? What should it do? What could it do? If you were going to give them some advice, people who were asking you the question, what would you say? Well, this picture is known as Pasteur's Quadrant. It goes back to a fellow named Donald Stokes, who was working at the Brookings Institution back in 1997. And you just see on the left, uh, inspired by the need for fundamental understanding, and on the top, the workers are inspired by the need to solve a problem. So in that upper left quadrant, the names in there are people who were doing science because they wanted to understand the world. They wanted to understand some problem related to science. And they were not motivated by translating that knowledge or solving some other problem. Einstein was not trying to solve, you know, create something that somebody could use. He was just trying to understand why the theory of gravity, as understood then, wasn't in fact adequate. Uh, people like Planck, had to come along and say, well, we can't explain the Rayleigh-Jeans law. How do we, in fact, solve that problem? And it was a radical idea. I don't know if Planck had put in a grant to the NSF <laughs> when he had that idea <laughs> that it would have been funded, but in any case. So that upper left-hand quadrant is you're just trying to understand the world around you. And the upper right-hand quadrant is you're driven, and it's called Pasteur's quadrant, is you're driven by trying to solve a problem, a disease, um, some problem, computing problem, et cetera. But you have an idea in mind of something you want to solve, and it leads you to a basic discovery. And uh, those two quadrants are where philanthropy can make an extraordinary difference for the future of science. I believe if you make an extraordinary difference for the future of science, you will do so for society. So there's the linkage. And you and we today stand on the shoulders of philanthropy supporting basic science. So this is a picture of Lawrence and Livingston, probably in the mid to late 1930s. I think this was the 84-inch uh, cyclotron. The first one you could hold in your hands that he made in 1929 or 30. The support to build those first cyclotrons fundamentally all came from either the state, the university's funding, or from philanthropy. The Research Corporation for Science Advancement was one of the first, but that machine was supported by the Macy Foundation, R.H. Macy, and the Rockefeller Foundation. They weren't getting government grants. They were getting philanthropic gifts to move the world forward. And what were they doing? They were trying to understand the nucleus. They didn't 
have in mind a particular practical application. Today, we're sitting in a place that has an $800 million a year budget, Paul, closely, right? Oh, yeah. The, 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 just south is the campus, all built on the shoulders of the concept of groups and trying to understand things in a fundamental sense. And here is just a collection of people who fit mostly in the upper left of the Pasteur's quadrant. But John Bardeen might be the name least familiar to the general public. And John Bardeen is the only one on this chart who won two Nobel Prizes in physics, one for the transistor and one for the theory of superconductivity. And he's holding there something that, well, from this distance, it sort of looks like a transistor radio, but it's not. Uh, it's one of the early circuits that they made back at Bell Labs, and he's, he was at that point at the University of Illinois. So John on this, John Bardeen on this chart was motivated by a desire to solve a problem. Bell Labs wanted to make a better communication system, and they funded work in basic science areas which they believed would lead to results that would change uh, communications, and surely it did. So, John was motivated by that, whereas I don't think Einstein was, I don't think Feynman was, I don't think Röntgen was, even though he found x-rays and look at the, the implications that that has had. So in the biological and chemical sciences, you've got an equally distinguished group. Fleming was motivated by trying to solve a disease. He discovered penicillin almost by accident. Uh, Pauling was both trying to understand things for practical reasons, but mostly he was just trying to understand the world around us. Uh, Watson and Crick stand on the shoulders of Pauling, and that's why I put it that way. Uh, Morgan, uh, you know, genetics, uh, Madame Curie was a chemist. Uh, and she won two Nobels, but in two different fields. So to close, you know, if I look to the future, philanthropy and science will be, I'm convinced, absolutely foundational for the societal and economic advancement of our culture. And therefore, we should ask, what will new philanthropists do? And we're living in an age where extraordinary fortunes are being made. What will those who are making those fortunes do with them? They will surely give back in some way. That is what history is telling us. I would suggest that they at least, I hope we can get some of the new wealth to consider two things. One, perhaps they would take a portfolio approach to philanthropy, just like they do in wealth management. When they manage their wealth, that's what they do. And no matter what their passion is for giving back, it's almost assuredly true that some of the solutions, if not all of the solutions, are built on the shoulders of some scientific discoveries. So why not do what you're passionate about doing, but also give to those fields of science that underpin the passion for philanthropy you have? And the other is where to do it. Provide that support at America's great research university enterprise and our great private nonprofit scientific institutions. If philanthropy plays that role, we actually will have a wonderful future. Uh, without it, we could have a wonderful future, but it will be much better if we continue to have philanthropy play a significant role. Thank you very much. Thanks,